Okay, welcome to uh, Caledonian Connection, so Arcadia University, the College of Global Studies lecture series. Um, we've had a series of authors come to speak to us over the last few semesters, uh, Alan Warner, Alice Thompson, uh, and uh, I'm uh, delighted uh, this evening to be able to introduce James Robertson, who has uh, written uh, a number of novels, uh, Five, five novels, yeah, five, five novels, um, uh, critically acclaimed, very important, important works, and they. If I had to describe them more broadly, I'll say let James speak for himself. But it really connects in a, a very deep way to Scottish culture and identity, uh, exploring themes, deep themes through particularly social issues, political issues, and it, it's it's wonderful to have this kind of intellectual, creative engagement with with uh, with these themes. So. Um, but I will, I will let James uh, speak for himself. One other issue he probably would like to touch on is his interest in the Scots language and uh, its, its relationship to, to national identity and its accessibility, accessibility to children as well. And that's been a, an important part of um, uh, James's contribution. And I'm sure he will we'll talk a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, well, thank you, thank, you, yeah, thank you very much for turning up on such a brief day um, to, to listen to me. And I'm, what, yeah, I'm going to talk, I'll divide this into two bits, I think, really. I'll talk about some of my own work uh, as a novelist and how that ties into um, some of the big political and cultural issues that are obviously going on in Scotland this year, leading up to this referendum in September, which I presume you all know is going to happen. Which is, you know, exciting and interesting, and nobody really knows quite what is going to happen. So, um, and that is interesting from my point of view because I've always been engaged with the politics of this country, and um, and to me, the politics and the culture very much overlap. And um, the book I'm really going to talk about mostly uh, is a novel called *And the Land Lays Still*, which, in many respects. Um, is a kind of fictional account of how we have got to where we are now politically. Um, um, so you can call that fortuitous or, or good luck on my part. But, um, but uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's a book that really does, I think, kind of uh, take the reader up to almost to the present in terms of, of, the, of the, the changes that have brought us to the referendum. Um, and then also, as, as, as Hamish just said, I want to talk a little bit about another aspect of my work, which is which is the Scots language and uh, a lot of work that I've done uh, around that and um, producing books for children and young readers uh, in Scots. Um, and that has been something that has been of great interest to me um, for many years, um, mainly because um, when I grew up, I grew up in, in, in uh, an English-speaking uh, household in central Scotland, um, but I was very conscious that all around me was this other language being spoken, um, or this other, this other use, form of words being used, um, which I was, was, was familiar with, but, but it wasn't spoken in, my, in as I say, in my um, family's house. Um, and uh, I, I, I didn't really know how that fitted into more, more general conceptions of of culture and education and so on. And then um, when I was 20, um, I was studying here, I was studying history at Edmund University, and when I was 20, I got the opportunity to go on an exchange scheme to the uh, University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, which will have some relevance to, to those of you who are uh, at Arcadia uh, there. So that was the first time at the age of 20 in the late 70s, that was the first time I'd ever been outside of the British Isles. So going from Edinburgh and, and sort of small town Scotland to Philadelphia was quite a culture shock for me. Um, and uh, it was fantastic, it was an amazing year. But what happened, and Hamish and I were just talking about this earlier on, what happened to me and what I think happens when you step outside your own country and your own culture, it makes you see it in a different way and it made me uh, see Scotland in a way that I hadn't really seen it before. And another thing that happened almost exactly the same time that I was getting on the aeroplane for the f first time I'd ever been in an aeroplane, um, uh, for the first time, uh, a poet called Hugh McDermott 
died uh, just around about that time. Now, I don't know if that name's familiar to, to you at all, but Hugh McDermott was a, a, a huge figure in Scottish cultural terms in the 20th century. Um, born, born in the late 18, in the, sorry, 1892, died in 1978, and single-handedly kind of revolutionised Scottish culture through most of the 20th century. Uh, and he was a poet who wrote in the Scots language. Now, when he died, as I said, I was pretty much um, airborne between here and Philadelphia, and um, I read obituaries about him in Philadelphia, in the, in the, because he was a big name, so he was in the international press in, in, in the news about his death. But I didn't know anything about him. I didn't. I hardly knew his name. I certainly hadn't read anything by him at that point. But something went off in my head and said, "This guy's important. You have to go and investigate." And I did, and, and what McDermott, reading McDermott's work did for me was to totally make me rethink a lot of my ideas about politics, culture, language, identity, all of that stuff. And that had a big impact on me uh, in terms of, of, of my own attitudes, not just to Scottish culture, but to culture generally, and literature in particular. And so I suppose in a way that's where my interest in language has really kind of um, come from, it's a combination of of the reality of it going on all around the book and listening to it and being fascinated by it and wanting to find out more about it and then the sort of uh, impact of uh, reading somebody whose entire corpus of poetry heavily depended upon this language which up until that point I had not appreciated could be used in that way. So I'll come back to that later on but let me start off with talking a wee bit about um, this, this book and the land is still. Uh, which uh, was my f uh, fourth novel. Uh, I published three books before this, um, which also touched on on Scottish cultural and historical and political themes, I suppose. Um, I won't go into them in too much detail, but one of them, for example, was a novel called Joseph Knight, uh, which was a historical novel um, based on the story of, of a man called Joseph Knight, who uh, was the who was a, a slave brought from Jamaica to Scotland by uh, his his Scottish master, and who, having been brought here, actually fought successfully for his freedom uh, in the Scottish courts. Um, and it was a very big landmark case in the history of slavery. Uh, he he won this case in 1778, which was a very long time before the abolition of the slavery act in uh, the. Westminster Parliament, and certainly a long, long time, about 70 years before slavery was abolished in the British colonies. Uh, uh, so um, that was a fascinating story that I, that I got intrigued by, partly because, again, it seemed to me to have been buried uh, and hidden uh, in our history, and it seemed to me that it was important to try and expose that story because it was, it was a fascinating story in terms of um, demonstrating the very strong links that existed and had existed between Scotland and the Caribbean and Jamaica in particular, uh, and all of which was history that, ha that had been unknown to me, uh, even though I'd done two history degrees uh, uh, here at Edinburgh. So um, this this process of discovery is something that's been going on uh, all through my, my adult life. Uh, it's almost like I, I lived in a country where I didn't actually know an awful lot of the stuff about it that I now do. Um, and that itself, I think, has informed a lot of my, my political views as well. This novel, And the Land is Still, as I said, I wrote, I, I, it was published in 2010, so uh, published four years ago. Uh, and it's a very big book. It's, it's, it's a, uh, when I finally handed the manuscript over to my agent, she said, this is not actually a book, this is three books. <laughs> and we did actually think if we could somehow divide it up into three and do it as, you know, as a... Um, but it was not going to work the way that it's structured. It would have been almost impossible to divide it satisfactorily into three bits. Um, what it is, is back in the 1980s and 90s, I was politically very active and I was campaigning, part of, part of a number of people, a number of groups and, and organisations that were campaigning for the re-establishment of the Scottish Parliament, uh, which didn't exist um, uh, then and hadn't existed since uh, since 1707, the union of parliaments uh, between the Scottish Parliament and the English Parliament. 
And um, so I'd be very active politically in that cause during the 80s and 90s. And at the time that I was involved in all of that stuff, I was also writing, I was writing poetry and short stories. I, hadn't, I had actually written a couple of novels, but they were awful, and I managed to hide them away in desks and, uh, and things. But, um, but, I, but I was writing, and I, and I knew really that that was what I was wanting to do uh, in sort of long term. Um, and I remember thinking at the time, this is an interesting period you're living through. There, is, uh, there are going to be history books written about this. And also, I thought, and there are other ways of telling the telling the story of this era, and fiction. I thought would be one of the ways that it could be told at a later date. But I didn't actually get around to doing that, to thinking about how to do that until 2006. Um, by that stage, by that stage, um, obviously the Scottish Parliament had been re-established. It had been in in, in operation for seven years. And at that point, I began to think, yeah, I'm now being able to look at this, uh, this over a, a long enough period to be able to see how this story might be told. And what I immediately realised was that I was going to have to go back, way back before the 1980s, to, to tell the, the story of these political and cultural changes that had led to the re-establishment of the Parliament. And I ended up going back to the 1950s and taking the story from there. So this story, this novel covers a period from roughly about 1950 to 2008 or thereabouts. It took me four years to write it, so um, and although I started in 2006 and finished in 2010, so I was able to kind of just readjust the ending as I was writing it. Um, and it was actually it was actually kind of weird because um, the, 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 there is there's a lot of politics in the book, it's, and it is about change in political terms as well as in social and cultural terms and what I kept finding was um, the, the real world was moving all the time when I was trying to write this fictional world so uh, you know I would kind of you know in 2006 the, uh, the administration um, in, the, in the Scottish Parliament was a, a Labour Liberal Democrat pact and then in 2007 um, astonishingly, they, they lost uh, the election and a minority Scottish National Party administration was formed. And I was busy writing this book going, just hang on a second here because I'm trying to get this finished. And then, luckily, I, I did get the book finished in 20, 2009, uh, thereabouts, and it was published, as I said, in 2010. And within a few months of it being published, we had a majority SNP administration elected, and it was like, that was, this was un, just, I couldn't believe it, and I don't think many people could believe it, because the way that the Parliament's electoral system had been set up, it was supposed to be impossible for anybody to get an overall majority, least of, least of all the SNP. So, as I was writing this fictional account of the, of the sort of period from the 50s through to the early noughties, uh, zero, whatever, whatever that phrase is, 2000s and and, and, and um, as I was writing this, the, 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 the real political ground kept shifting under my feet, and it was kind of odd to be to be to be writing this. The thesis of this book, if you like, is that in 1950, in my view, Scotland was about as British as tied in to the British state as it ever was. Um, if you think about it in these terms. Um, the Second World War is five years older, so there's been a very united British um, um, fight against fascism uh, and the, the defeat of Nazi Germany uh, during that war. And at the end of the war, there's been a general election which has delivered an overwhelming Labour majority, which leads to the establishment of the welfare state, the National Health Service, and these sort of modern attributes of, the British society, of British society. And at that point, Scotland, it seems to me, is absolutely tied into uh, the, the, the continuation of the British project. It's also um, right at the apex of, 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 the, um, of the British Empire, that the British Empire is about to start being dismantled. And so, in fact, already in some respects, that's already begun to happen. But within a couple of years of the end of the, first, of the Second World War, you have 
um, uh, the, the independence of India and Pakistan. And then very shortly after that, most of the African colonies start to, to gain independence. And so the empire is coming to an end. But that, it seems to me, at 19, in 1950, you, you're at the, the peak or the, 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 the sort of culminating moment of the British Empire. You've got the, the victory uh, 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 of the Allies um, uh, against uh, fascism in Europe. And you've got the establishment of uh, the modern British state through, through the health service and, and the welfare state. And, and, and there's very little sense at that point that Scotland is going to do anything other than just say, yeah, this is fine, we're part of this, we will continue to, to go along with this. And yet, within a relatively short space of time, within about 20 or 30 years, that um, tied in uh, sense of, of, of Scotland and other bits of, of the United Kingdom uh, being, being, being firmly tied into to the United Kingdom begins to, to, to weaken and fall apart. And it seems to me that we have moved over the last 50, 60 years from that kind of situation to a situation where the United Kingdom is very much a disintegrating entity. Um, we now have a parliament in Scotland, we have uh, 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 an assembly in Wales which is now getting more beefed up powers. We've also had a very interesting situation in Ireland uh, where Northern Ireland uh, also has an assembly and uh, where relationships between uh, the Irish Republic and the UK have become much uh, more friendly than perhaps they might have been in previous times. And there's all kinds of ways in which these different bits of, of the United Kingdom are kind of re-establishing their own identities. And that seems to me to be particularly true of Scotland. And that's the story I've tried to tell politically. And I've tried to tell that through a number of families and characters, fictional characters, who move through this entire period and whose lives and the events in whose lives interact and interconnect with each other at various points. It's quite a complicated book um, with a lot of characters, a big, a big cast of characters, some of whose names even I keep forgetting. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, and um, the way that I've structured it as well, it goes back, it dots back and forth. It's not a linear novel in the sense that it does, it starts off with somebody uh, in about 2005 thinking back over his life and then it dots back and forth between different characters and it's only the deeper you read into the novel uh, that you realise that there are actually quite close connections going on between these apparently very disparate stories and different kinds of characters. Um, and I'll read you a passage or so from this in just a second um, to try and illustrate that. Um, uh, what else do I need to tell you about this? Yeah, it's not just about politics. There is a lot of politics in here, but, uh, but there's a lot of other stuff going on. Because it seems to me the other really important thing that I wanted to address was that period from the 50s through to, to the present day um, has been a change of a, a time of massive, massive social change, not just here, but throughout the world. Um, there isn't a country in the world that hasn't dramatically changed in that period in all kinds of different ways. Um, and if you think about the changes that have occurred from the 60s and 70s through to today, technical changes in terms of technology, changes in the way that people go to work, uh, you know, the, the big, uh, it's certainly in industrial societies that have now moved to being post-industrial societies. You know, where, when I was growing up uh, in the 60s and 70s, the vast majority of people in Scotland who went to work went to work in factories, you know, factories that employed dozens or hundreds or sometimes thousands of people. And when the factory um, sirens went off, you know, hordes and hordes of people would come out of these, one, these places of, of employment and go home for their tea or whatever. Those days are over in the sense of, of how people go to and from work in this country. There's been other kind of revolutions as well going on. Um, Scotland in 1960 was, uh, at least on the face of it, a very religious country. Um, lots and lots of people went to church. The, ch the membership of the Church of Scotland in 1960 was, I think I'm right in saying, uh, 1.2 million, which in a population of 5 million is just phenomenally high. It doesn't mean to say that they were all religious, but they all at least belonged or seemed to belong to a church and there were also very very a large percentage of the population particularly in the west of Scotland is Roman Catholic um, six seven hundred thousand people again they tied in to to, uh, to their church um, 
But you move from that period, that place to now, and Scotland, it seems to me, has become an incredibly secular country very, very quickly. I mean, again, when I grew up in the 60s, um, um, and Hamish, you probably remember this as well, what were Scot Scottish Sundays like in the 1960s? They were pretty quiet. <laughs> Peaceful, yeah. I mean, there's, there's there's a part of me that regrets the loss of them. They were, you know, the shops did not open. Not a single shop opened. The paper shop in the morning would open for a bit, and that would be it. Um, where I grew up, there was a, a play park, um, you know, with swings and roundabouts and so on, just across the street, uh, and they were chained up on a Sunday, so you couldn't actually go and play on because that was considered to be bad form, uh, you know. And if you didn't go to church, you certainly weren't expected to go out and and, and be recreational. People didn't play golf on a Sunday. Didn't, people didn't do anything like that. Pubs and hotels weren't open. It was it was literally that it was the Lord's day. It was a day of rest uh, and prayer, and that's what you did. That's completely vanished, gone. I mean, yeah, you know, su you know, people supermarkets are busier on a Sunday than they are on a on a Wednesday now. Um, and <laughs> like you, part of me goes, oh God, it was really nice back then, you know. But but it, there was a downside as well. So that's another change that's completely different. Um, and another really big change is the change in the position and role of women in society. Uh, I mean, dramatically different, I think, now from what it was like in the, in the 50s and 60s. Um, um, different, different, completely different attitudes to sex and sexuality as well. I mean, these, you know, like, again, if you think, when I, when I think back to Scotland in the, in the 1970s and 80s, it was, I think, undoubtedly, quite a homophobic society. And I think, again, the fact that, you know, things have moved on so rapidly from that and we've become such a, a tolerant and, and much more relaxed and open society around a whole load of issues, including sexuality, seems to me to be a dramatic change. Uh, and a change that I think most people, if they could have looked forward from the 60s to now, would have just thought utterly impossible to imagine. So these are all the kinds of things I wanted to try and capture in this book. And I'm conscious I've already gone on for quite a long time. So let me give you a, read a passage, uh, a passage from this book, just to give you a sense of it. Um, I'm going to go back to... Um, um, a passage... This is a young bo a young man called uh, Jimmy. He's a boy. I'm sorry, he's a boy called Jimmy. Uh, at this point, he grows up to be, and he changes his name or he uses his middle name Peter. And the reason he does that is because um, uh, as, uh, his, his second name is Bond. Uh, so his <laughs> as a child, his name is Jimmy Bond or James Bond. And he grows up, and he ends up actually he ends up working for the British intelligence services uh, service. And of course, this is before the other James Bond is on the scene, uh, or at least he was christened before the other James Bond was famous. Um, so when he realises that um, he's got this slightly embarrassing, awkward name, he decides to call himself Peter instead. Um, and um, part of the story, the middle part of the novel, is actually about this guy, Peter Bond, who, who, um, who thinks he's going to have a glamorous career in the intelligence services and go off and... Uh, and, uh, and do exciting things in foreign parts. And what they do is they put him in Scotland to look after the, to sort of monitor the sort of extreme wing of of nationalism and the slightly sort of the, the stuff that's going under the under the, going on under the blankets, as it were, in Scotland in the 1960s and 70s. And this disappoints him hugely, and he um, takes uh, um, takes his disappointment to the bottle and becomes an alcoholic. So his part of the story is him looking back over his life um, through, uh, through a very, very um, uh, alcoholic, a very, very hazy alcoholic memory. Um, but I'm going to go take you back to, um, to his childhood in the, in the 50s. He's, um, he's, he's, he's very young here. And he has a, um, his family a, a sort of artisan class, a sort of um, well-to-do working class. Um, and they have a, he has a, a, an uncle called Uncle Jack. Um, who's a bit odd, and I'm going to tell you about what happens uh, when the family goes to visit Uncle Jack. Uncle Jack, uh, and the only other thing you need to know is that um, Jimmy's uh, mom and dad are called Peggy and Hugh. Uncle Jack, Peggy Bond's younger brother, was special, set apart. Probably the family wouldn't have had much to do with him, but blood's thicker than water. Hugh said. Special was one word for him. Jimmy's word. 
But the ones he heard his parents use were odd, strange, cracked, damaged and mad. He didn't say mad often, but Jimmy liked it best because it was way off the scale of normality. And so he thought of him as Mad Uncle Jack, although he was careful never to say it out loud. He must have been nearly six when he first met him, back from the war with Sarah, his new English wife. It was the war that made those words fit Uncle Jack, being captured by the Japanese and made to work on their hellish railway for four years. Hugh sucked in his cheeks and shook his head and the rotten shame of it. No, Jack was never going to be right again. Not that he ever could be. Completely right, Peggy said. And Jimmy understood from this that the war wasn't to be held entirely responsible. And there was that other weird, embarrassing thing about Jack. He was a Scottish nationalist. Hugh and Peggy were unionists, but a number of their friends were Labour, and they even knew a couple who voted for the Liberals, but the only Scottish nationalist in their circle was Uncle Jack, if you could call it a circle, and if you could pretend that he was in it. Hugh was only able to say Scottish nationalist out of the side of his mouth, and usually raised his eyebrows in a meaningful way when he did. Jimmy wondered why the two words went so insistently and inseparably together. Uncle Jack wasn't going to be an English or a French nationalist, was he? Jimmy filed his riddle away for further consideration. He saw Uncle Jack only once or twice a year at most, so maybe he was in his company eight or nine times before the disappearance. Feels like it should be more. Uncle Jack looms larger than that. But just before Jimmy turned 11, Jack was gone. Jimmy's grandparents on that side, the Gordon side, they both died during the war and never saw Jack come home, but they left him all their money. Jimmy's mother never complained about that. She said she had nothing to complain about. She was provided for, and anyway, there wasn't that much. But there was enough for him to put down the deposit on a bungalow in Oregon, and he and Sarah settled down there, and a while later their daughter Barbara was born. A bot hoose, Hugh used to say. Wheel, wheel. There wasn't much communication between the two families, but from time to time a reluctant sense of duty and sympathy for Sarah got the better of Jimmy's parents, and the Bonds boarded the bus to Horriburn and descended on the Gordons en masse. Jimmy would have detested these visits, but for the brooding presence of Uncle Jack, the way he managed not to, to participate in conversations, or the way he dropped in a remark that reduced the other grown-ups to silence, was a marvel to Jimmy. His sisters didn't like Uncle Jack. They found him intimidating, but Jack was, but Jimmy was fascinated. He admitted it once on the bus home. One of the occasions he learned it was better not to speak at all. I really like Uncle Jack, he said. His mother turned in her seat and gave him a hard stare. Liking him's fine, she said. Just don't grow up to be like him. How no, he asked. Why not, she corrected. Because you're enough like him already, that's why not. He started to say something else, but his father, sitting next to him, said, That'll do, Jimmy. How was he like him? He didn't think he looked like him, but then he didn't think he looked much like his father either, or his mother. He didn't say much, and Uncle Jack didn't say much. Maybe that was it. The way you could say a lot by saying very little. There was this one day they were at Quarryburn, a Sunday in March, just a day or two before the disappearance. Elspeth and Etta, that's Jimmy's sisters, were cooing over Barbara in the living room, and Barbara was just about tolerating them. Peggy was putting a brave face on being with Sarah in the kitchen, and the men, his father and Uncle Jack and himself, had stepped out of the back door and were standing in manly silence with their coats on. Well, Uncle Jack was standing in silence, staring at the grass that was not yet ready to be cut, or at the neat, empty beds, or maybe not staring at anything. And Hugh stamped his feet and got out his pipe and lit it, and made a comment about family life and wondered when Barbara might be getting a wee brother or sister to keep her company. And still Jack said nothing. But Hugh just kept on and on what it was like having a house full of bairns. Jack would never have a minute's piece of his experience with anything to go by. Not that he resented his own flesh and blood. He wasn't saying that, but that was the truth of the matter. Not a minute's piece. And Jimmy thought if his Uncle Jack was thinking anything, it was exactly that. And he just wished his father would shut up. 
There was something intense and dignified about the way Uncle Jack didn't respond, didn't even look at Hugh. But eventually the insistent prattle must have triggered something inside him. I think I'll take a stroll up the hill, he said. Get some fresh air. Oh, Hugh said, I think it's pretty fresh out here myself, he said, through a cloud of pipe smoke. Not for me, Uncle Jack said. And then he said a truly wonderful thing. Are you coming, Jimmy? And then a concession to Hugh that was also a very definite indicator that he wasn't invited, he said. If that's all right with you, Hugh. It's time Jimmy and I were better acquainted. Jimmy glanced at his father, who, wrong-footed, suddenly seemed to him more childish than he was himself. He didn't think of himself as a child anyway. Well, I, I didn't ken, Hugh said, flustered. I mean, it's three o'clock now. How long do you think you might be? We hate to catch the bus home soon enough. Jack said, calm as anything. Oh, the bus doesn't go till five. We'll just take a walk up the woods and back. We'll not be more than an hour. And Hugh looked out of breath at the very thought and conceded defeat with a nod. It'll be the five o'clock bus for us then, Jimmy. Mind that, he said. And Jimmy felt a thrill that his uncle, mad Uncle Jack, had asked him to go with him alone. But he kept it off his face, held it down inside him, smiled reassuringly at his worried-looking father. And then he and Jack set off round the house and away up the street, past the last of the bungalows to where the tarmac gave out and the track into the woods began. And have I got time to just do a wee bit more of this? I'm not sure. I might have to cut it a wee bit. Yeah, I will actually. Because it, 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 Jack, as you'll have gathered, he's come back from the war. He's a very damaged man for all kinds of reasons because he's had a terrible time in a, in a prisoner of war camp. And Jack eventually, well, what's going to about to happen is that Jack leaves home and disappears. And Jack never comes back again. He, uh, he, he, he becomes a wanderer over the next several decades. And he forms a, another part of the book. He becomes a kind of an undercurrent in the rest of the novel as well. Um, and so I'll tell you a wee bit, I'll just read a wee bit more about this. It's, it's only about another page or so. The first Jimmy knew about the disappearance was three or four days later, back at home. Um, he has a definite member of his fa a memory of his father taking him through to the front room one evening where they hardly ever went and in a very serious voice telling him to sit on the sofa. Opposite him in one of the armchairs was a big blue jawed policeman in a blue uniform with his hat in his lap and a notebook and pencil resting on top of it. This is Sergeant Ritchie, Hugh said. Now, Jimmy, it's about your Uncle Jack, so I want you to think carefully and tell us everything you can. No need to be afraid, son, Ritchie said. Just tell us about last Sunday. What about last Sunday? Was there anything your Uncle Jack said that was odd when you went for that walk with him? Anything at all? Hey, what's happened? It's all right, son, you're not in any trouble, Ritchie said. Your, uncle, your, your uncle's gone missing, Hugh said, and the police are trying to find him. So, did he say anything odd, or did anything unusual happen on your walk, Richie said. Jimmy did what he thought was a good impression of weighing up the question. No, he said. Think, Jimmy. You were away with him for an hour and a half, at least, his father said. What did you talk about? You must have talked about something. We just walked, he said. He doesn't say much, Uncle Jack. That's true enough, you said. A man of few words is my brother-in-law, Sergeant. But did he not say anything, son? Nothing, Peter remembers, that he cared to repeat. Uncle Jack had started to tell him about when he was a prisoner of the Japanese. He talked about a man who tried to escape into the jungle and what had happened when he was recaptured. Jimmy saw it all, heard the slice of blade through neck, the horror of it. But he said nothing, just strode along beside his uncle, up through the trees, up and up till they came to the edge of the wood and a stone dike, and beyond it the moor and hills in the distance, and they stood there, warm in the cold afternoon, and Uncle Jack put his hand on Jimmy's shoulder and said, I love this country, Jimmy, but there's too much wrong with it. There's too much wrong with the world. Do you know what I'm saying? And the hand squeezed his shoulder and Jimmy felt awkward. The word love made him feel uncomfortable. Uncle Jack turned and crouched down till their faces were level and his eyes were very blue as they stared into Jimmy's and he said in a harsh whisper, Of course you don't. 
But you will. You're the same as me, lad. You don't fit. I can tell. I've had enough. I'm going away. Don't tell anyone I told you that. When you're old enough, you get away too. You'll understand when it's time. And Jimmy didn't know what he was on about. It was a bit scary, but exciting too. And then Uncle Jack's hand swept the ground and he put something into Jimmy's hand. A wee stone. And he said, don't forget this. And he stood up and said in a different kind of voice, We'd better be heading back or your father will be anxious. And the stone was in Jimmy's pocket and they made their way back to the path and came up over the rise. And there was a man and a much weird boy coming towards them out of the trees. We just walked, Jimmy said. He said about how he liked Scotland, that was all. Did you see anybody when you were out, when you were out with him? Aye, a man called Don. How do you count his name? He told me it. He had a wee boy with him, his son, I think, called Billy. The sergeant consulted his notebook and nodded at Jimmy's father. That's right enough. Very good, son. You should be doing my job. How long has he been missing? Jimmy said. He is steady on. I was joking, Richie said. And he and you laughed. And then Richie said, a couple of days. And you said, we're worried about him. So if there's anything you've no tell us, Richie said, it's important that you speak up now. You're practically the last person he spoke to. Jimmy shook his head and there was silence in the room and eventually Richie spoke again. I'm going to ask you something difficult, he said. Did anything happen that your uncle might have felt ashamed of? Or that you feel ashamed of? Anything that might have made him panic? Anything that might have driven him to run away? Jimmy looked at his father. His father looked away. Jimmy thought, you can't deal with this, but I can. He shook his head. Anything bad happened, Richie said. Shook his head again. Did he touch you at all, Richie said. Did he interfere with you? No, Jimmy said. He never laid a finger on me. It's not like that. All right, son, Richie said. I guess you care what I'm talking about. I just had to ask. We're trying to establish what makes your Uncle Jack tick. So are you going to find him? Jimmy asked. Oh, I will find him, Richie said. Didn't you worry about that? Jimmy nodded. He wasn't worried. They wouldn't find Uncle Jack. And they didn't have a clue what made him tick. He felt a stone in his pocket. So Jimmy's an outsider and Uncle Jack's an outsider. And, and their sort of stories underpin a lot of what goes on in the rest of the novel, um, which is about the people who are living the sort of lives on the surface and how they progress uh, over the years. And I realise I've actually overshot the, the time a little bit. Um, uh, not enough time to talk. Can I move on to talk about this? Yeah, that's uh, maybe that's a point to leave that novel and and that discussion for for questions are just at the end. Um, or we could do that now and then come back to this. What do you think is the best way of doing this? Uh, I think yeah. Keep Should we just and just keep going we'll and back. have questions at the end? Okay. You'll have noticed as I was reading that there was a fair number of words were coming in, words like Ken and Denny and so on, which are, which are words that I would uh, would absolutely you know would be described as, as Scots words. Um, but hopefully that the context there was not uh, in any way too difficult. If you've spent any time in Edinburgh at all, then and I'm quite sure if you've uh, wandered down the streets or got on the bus or, or been in a taxi or whatever, you will have realised that there is a, a, a different linguistic register going on in, in, in different parts of the city and certainly in other parts of Scotland as well. Um, and that's what I want to talk about just now. Um, this is the, these slides actually belong to a talk that I gave in the British Library last year. Um, uh, language of Burns, language of Robert Burns, the language of the gutter. And the reason I called that, that was because Scots is, is, occupies this very strange place in, in our society. Unlike Gaelic, which now has official recognition and status, uh, Scots is, is sort of recognised, but it's not really got any status. Um, it's, it's considered to be... Um, there's a big debate about what is it. Is it a language? Is it a dialect? Is it a branch of English? Is it something separate or is it something similar? Um, and one of the problems for Scots, unlike Gaelic, even though Gaelic is spoken by far, far fewer people in Scotland, Gaelic is so distinctively, obviously different from English that it's much easier to say, right, that is Gaelic and that is English. Um, with Scots, it's more difficult because most of us um, uh, who use Scots at all um, uh, will we'll sort of move along a, uh, a sort of spectrum of, of language. Um, if you can imagine sort of the broadest possible kind of Scots with the most kind of different vocabulary at one end and sort of formal standard English at the other. 
many, many people in Scotland kind of move along that register in the way they speak, depending upon who they're speaking to. So if they're speaking to their own um, peers who are Scots speakers, then they gravitate towards the Scots end of the spectrum. And if they're speaking in a formal situation or in education, for example, they'll gravitate towards the other end. Um, but it's certainly the case if you go into certain communities in Scotland, lots of, lots of communities in Scotland, um, uh, you will find you'll hear very little English spoken in a, in, in a sort of formal sense. Uh, and I find that really interesting that this, this language occupies this kind of slightly weird place where nobody quite knows how to define it. Um, but I wanted to, to just, uh, just give you a, a wee brief introduction to this, some of the work that I've done with, with colleagues um, uh, with producing books in Scots for uh, young readers and children. Um, just to give you an, an indication, is, is Scots a language, is it a dialect or whatever? Well, here's a list of, of, of Danish words and a list of Scots words and a list of English words. You can see that the Scots words, at least on the face of it, have far more in common with the Danish words than they do with the English words here. Um, they are, um, I'm, not, I'm not even sure the, the full pronunciation of the Danish words. Um, greet for, for you know, if you cry, you know, if, you, if you greet, and then greeta in Danish, uh, ken and ken for no, um, um, yeah, um, after, or like, you know, um, after this lecture I'm going to go home, um, uh, is exactly the same word in Danish uh, as opposed to in English. And, and again, hus in Danish is pronounced in the same way that hus is pronounced here. So you can see there's, uh, there's, there's a lot of similarities between, the, between Danish and Scots in, in, in those instances. You can do the same if you make comparisons with, uh, with Scots and French, for example. A lot of Scots words uh, are loan words from French that have come in, uh, came in in the uh, 16th, 15th and 16th centuries because it was very close uh, trading and political uh, relationship with France at that time. Lots of other words came from um, the Netherlands and from Flanders and, and Belgium uh, for similar reasons as well. Um, but these are just very, very brief examples of, of um, uh, to, 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 to fash is to annoy somebody, or if you're fash, then you're really annoyed. Uh, obviously, it comes directly from the French, uh, uh, fâché, and some of the other ones there you can see. Um, we, not all of these words, all, most of these words are still in, in use. Uh, Omri is not really a, a word you would come across anymore, but uh, certainly um, words like saibi or saibo for spring onion is still very commonly used, and grosse for a gooseberry, and, and so on. So these are these are not um, dead words at all, um, but you wouldn't necessarily hear them spoken in a formal situation. Um, then you move on to words which, uh, uh, these words are put in because they are, um, there's lots of words in Scots that are cognate with English words. Hus and house, heim and home, more and mayor. Um, uh, you know, there's a vowel change, uh, which, which is, but otherwise the words are basically the same. I, I, personally, I think you would, I would describe them as different words. But you can see that you've got the same roots and so on. But then there are lots and lots and lots of words which are completely different. So these words here in Scots, which mean what they say in English here, are, are obviously very different words uh, from, from, from the English words. Um, in fact, there are some words on there that, uh, that um, I didn't even know were in Scots words. And, and even if you speak, even if you speak Scottish English. Um, a lot of Scots words are, are in there. So, like the word, the word pinky, for example, uh, I, I had no idea that that was actually a specifically Scots word until I was about 20. Um, and, and this word scale for a splinter, you know, for a wee splinter you get in your finger as well. Um, so there's, there's interesting things there. Now, the next, um, the next lot, are what you might call um, going to the sort of the, the far end of the spectrum. These are, these are more kind of um, um, sort of uh, um, slightly more literary words in some respects, but they're, they're, they're complete, you know, they're, they're kind of big, different words. So, uh, and again, it's just to demonstrate that there's this wealth of, of amazing language that um, the vast majority of people go through their, their education in Scotland without getting any um, educational um, uh, input into this language at all. And the only way that you discover all of these words is by reading poetry um, uh, or reading, uh, reading older literature. Um, but again, well, not all of them. Peely Wally is a word that, uh, that is very, very common. Uh, if somebody's not feeling very well and they look at it, seek and pale, then uh, Peely Wally is the word that you would use to describe them. Um, the tatty bogle for a scarecrow is a, is a very common word as well. Um, and even even uh, a bubbly joke is not, not unheard of for a turkey as well. And um, 
Um, but, but this one at the bottom, the yo trommel, is a very literary word now that you would probably, it probably would have been a word that was commonly used um, in, when, when Scotland was more agrarian uh, uh, and so on. But I would suspect, apart from one or two remote borders, shepherds, that probably is not a word that, um, that most people would come across now. But it appears in a poem by Hugh McDermott, interesting enough, that's where I first came across it. And then um, uh, this is a, a phrase, um, a, a, a set of phrases from the program uh, Chewing the Fat. I don't know if anybody's seen any Chewing the Fat um, sketches on television. Yeah, okay. It's a, it's a catchphrase from a sketch from that program. It's a, and it's a three line, and I don't think I've got time to go into the, the full nuances of it, but basically it's two characters. One is always annoying or fashion, the other one. And uh, so the first one says that the, the one who's being annoyed will ask the, the other chap to stop doing it. God ain't no do that. Um, um, now, his response is how, which actually means why in Scots, um, so that's quite confusing. And then the response is just God ain't no. In other words, please, would you please stop this because it's driving me nuts. Now, there's only four, five, six, seven words in that, or eight words in that, uh, in that little exchange. But you could actually write books about the grammatical deconstruction of what's going on here. It's really quite fascinating. Uh, go back more time. So, um, um, this is a, a, to give you an illustration of, of Scots from way, way, way back in the 15th, uh, late 15th, early 16th century, uh, by a very, very wonderful poet called William Dunbar. This is the poem on his heat ache. I've reproduced this as it, is, as it was printed back then. So you can see that some words like heat. Uh, uh, were being written down in exactly the way that they are still pronounced to this day. Uh, I wouldn't expect you to work this out entirely uh, from looking at it. Um, I'll just read it out to you. My heed did yak yesternacht this day to mark that I na mecht. Um, to mark in this instance means to make poetry, to write poems. And you may be aware that we have a national poet in Scotland called Liz Lockhead, who is our national macker, which means poet basically. So that's another word that has survived uh, right down to the present day. My heat did yak yesterday, I was very sore. This day to mark that I had a mix, so I was unable to write poetry. So say the migraine, migraine, does me many, does me hurt. Piercing my brew as on a ganye, piercing my, my head like an arrow, that scant I look me on the lake that I can hardly bear to look at the light. So it's basically talking about having a terrible, terrible headache, and it's, it's incredibly uh, real. Yeah. And now, sir, lately after mess, after mass, to date, thought I began to dress. That's a quite difficult line. So, uh, though I began to uh, think, thinking that I would actually sit down and get on some work, the sentence, the sense of what I was trying to write, lay full evil to find. Unsleep it in my heat behind, dull it in dullness and distress. In other words, I couldn't even let it concentrate, is what you see. <laughs> Full oft at morrow I uprise, when that my courage sleeping lies. Um, for mirth, for menstruality and play, for din nor dancing nor deray, it will not walk in me no wise. Um, often when I get up in the morning, um, uh, my, uh, my skill is lying asleep. And it doesn't matter, mirth, minstrelsy and play, uh, I can jump about and dance and all right, but I still can't get my, my poetic muse to work for me. It will not walk in me, no wise. Um, that's, a very, that's a very, very brief uh, sort of uh, interpretation of what that little short poem means. But what's fascinating about that is if you, if you take a, a poem written at the same time in English, in England and in English, um, it's, it's a, it feels and looks like a completely different poem uh, language from modern English, whereas there's still very large elements of medieval Scottish language that are still being used today on a daily basis. Uh, now, McDermott, um, uh, there's that, the word, use of the word yow trouble. Now, this is going to the, the high end of literary Scots here. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful poem, but I don't think I can. Again, I would have take about half an hour to explain to you what's going on in this poem. It's very, very complicated, but it's absolutely beautiful. Um, um, I'll just read it to you, but I don't think I can even... It'll take so long to explain what it all means. Um, a wheat for nicht in the yow trommel, I saw yon antren thing, a water gob, each chitter and licht, a yon the on down, and I thought in that last wild look, ye deed, a for ye deed. Um, He's talking, he's addressing his father, who's dead, um, um, 
one one evening at that time when the sheep shearing is, you know, it's a bit chilly because of the sheep being sheared, I saw that unusual thing, an indistinct rainbow with a shivery light beyond the downpour, and I thought of the last wild look that you gave before you died. There was nae reek in the Leverox hoose that night, and nae in mine, but I he thought that that foolish licht ever since sign, and I think that maybe at last I ken what your look meant then. Um, that's such a such a uh, an idiomatic expression. It's almost impossible to explain it. Um, but he's basically he's, he's thinking about his memory of his father, and he's thinking that he's finally worked out what his father was trying to say with, to him with that last look. Um, I put that up there to show you basically that, um, that again, whatever one thinks of the of the relationship between Scots and English, and whatever one thinks of the way one defines Scots, I don't think there's any doubt when you look at a poem like that that it is a fully fledged language in its own right. Um, now just to get on a bit and moving on slightly, I set up along with a, a colleague and, and uh, going into, pub, uh, into, into uh, business with a, a, a publisher based in Edinburgh, a little um, publishing imprint called Lecce Coup about uh, 12 years ago. And we wanted to, what we wanted to do was make available um, books in Scots to young readers and children because they just weren't available, there was nothing. But we knew because we'd done work in schools before, that actually there was quite a hunger and demand for these for, 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 for work in Scots to be available. And so we started publishing books uh, which have been very successful and, and which have sold in large quantities. And the response of the children who, when they suddenly, suddenly realise that the language that they bring to school is being legitimised and being given sort of authority by being published in a book is just incredible. Um, and it's like you can see lights going on all over the place in the classroom because they they have been told mostly, um, not necessarily by their teachers who are much, getting much more sophisticated about this, this issue now, but they've been told mostly that what they speak is bad English or slang. And what we do is we go and say, no, what you're actually speaking is Scots. So heat is not bad English, it's good Scots. And we try to, to, to get across the idea that there are different registers for speech and that you, you should be able to switch registers depending upon the circumstances in which you, you're, you're speaking. Um, and it's, it's quite challenging, uh, to, but once, once the, the bears get that, they, they respond incredibly well to it, very enthusiastically, particularly reluctant readers, interestingly enough, and particularly boys who are perhaps disruptive in class, they suddenly realise that they're quite good at this because they know all the words and they know all the pronunciations. Um, this, this might be a familiar book to you, um, Rob Downs with the Twits, my colleague Matthew Fitt translated it into Scots as the Egypts. <laughs> and it's been phenomenally successful. And what's really interesting about this, we've done a number of translations now, and what's really interesting about this is that um, um, uh, some children now are reading the Scots book before they read the English book, and that really does challenge your sense of linguistic kind of, uh, um, you know, which is the, 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 the senior language, if you like. We did subsequent ones, George's Marvelous Medicine, uh, again, Matthew translated that into Geordie's Mingin Medicine. Uh, Mingin is a word that means gasping or revolting, so it's not quite the same as marvellous, but it has the same alliter alliterative effect. And then I did um, Fantastic Mr. Fox, and translated as the Sleeket Mr. Todd. Um, a Todd is a Scots word for, for a fox, and Sleeket um, does not mean fantastic, it means cunning, uh, but you have to be cunning to be a fantastic uh, fox, so that was where that came from. Um, this is just an, ex uh, an example, this is from uh, the, the, the Egypt's the puddock, and my frog had just wiped on her face. Um, and this is when he, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Twit in the original version gets Mr. Twit to eat um, spaghetti that's got worms in it. Um, um, but here she's saying it's cried, surely spaghetti is bra, get it, do you well, it's good and hot. Um, <laughs> The, the, the response is just, the, not only do the kids find it fascinating and they find it hilariously funny as well, but they actually just really respond because they're hearing their own sounds uh, being, being read out. I translated Winnie the Pooh, I don't know if people have read Winnie the Pooh, but I translated Winnie the Pooh into Scots as well, and that seemed to go down. Uh, interestingly, that worked as well, which demonstrated to me that you can take pretty much any kind of text or, lang or literature from any other language and it will work in Scots in some form or other. Um, I won't read all that out because it's quite a lot of text, but um, that's pretty looking at uh, he uh, which is the, the name that I've retitled Eeyore with. Um, 
but it, that, that really appeals to slightly older readers, but it still works. And that was the, the, the House at Pooh Corners uh, translated there as the, the House at Pooh's Nuke. Um, what else have we got here? Yeah, these are just some snapshots of where you might see Scots actually uh, visible uh, in the environment. And if you're ever going up to Aberdeen uh, on the motorway there, there's this place that's been there for years, and it has this, uh, this slogan along its wall, you may gang for and fair war. Um, you may go a long way and not eat as well as you will here. <laughs> and what it's saying, um, this is a, a, a carriot um, called the Takawa, um, which um, totally makes sense. Actually, they haven't got this quite right because that should really say carry out. Um, but good, good shot, really. I quite like that. Um, this is, uh, again, if you're driving up the A9, there's, a, there's a, an outdoor activity place called Nay Limits. Um, there's loads of these, actually. I, I keep meaning to collect them all and, 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 and so on. Um, this is a pub in, in Cooper and Fife called the Trucket Dug. Trucket meaning soaked or, or you know, completely soaked through. Um, uh, and this is a pun. The, the, the fish merchant's name is Mayor, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so this is Eat Mayor Fish. Uh, and uh, there's an interesting one in, in St Andrews. Um, this is where uh, linguistic imperialism is taking place. Uh, it's uh, Baker Lane, formerly Baxter Wine. <laughs> There's nobody here called Baxter by any chances. I know. If your name is Baxter, it means you, you were a ba you, you originally you were a baker. Um, so this has been changed from Baxter Wine to Baker Lane. It's terrible. It should be changed back again. Um, uh, but here's a, here's a, another street name in uh, I think that's in Ochter, Buchty, um which has got the Scots name Brayheed, uh, top of the hill, and that's the name of the street. And so and you find these different things going on in different places. And this is um, outside the Scottish Parliament and um, uh, in, 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 uh, engraved into the, into the stone, stones there. It's a passage from the New Testament in Scots, which was a, it's a wonderful book that was uh, produced in the in 1980s. Um, and it's the passage from Corinthians, whatever it is, I've forgotten which chapter and verse it is. Um, if I speak with the tongue of men, men and angels, uh, and it says, again, I speak with the tongue, tongues of men and angels, but I hear no love in my head. I am no name better, nor dunner in breast, or a ring in symbol. Um, and that's probably a good point at which to stop. Um, and please feel free to ask questions about anything that we've done, you know, the, the fiction, the language, or anything else that you want to ask me about. And thank you very much for listening. Whistle stop too, dear. Um, sorry. <laughs> not to kind of suck all of the fun out of the translation, but um, in terms of sort of grammatical structure and things like that, is what is Scots similar to? I have no sense of it, but is it sort of similar to English or in grammar? Latin? Yeah, grammar. It, yeah. I mean, I mean, basically, where Scots comes from is the same as where English comes from. It. They, they, they are. They are both descended from. Old English, which is a Germanic language, uh, which is connect, you know, which is similar to Danish, German, and other languages, um, but quite early, about, about 800 years ago, um, they begin to diverge. You get Old English breaks down into northern Eng a northern version and a southern version, and then the northern version breaks further down into sort of um, what's then spoken sort of around the. the from about the Humber south and what's spoken further north and then politics starts to come into it and this is where, where the discussion gets very interesting. Once Scotland and England have become um, firmly established as separate kingdoms then the languages begin to gravitate politically as well. So, um, but fundamentally in terms of their origin, they, 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 they do come from the same root and therefore their grammars are actually very similar. There are some differences but, um, but, um, but basically Scots grammar and English grammar is pretty much the same. Yeah. When you're going to schools with translations of the kids books, do you ever find that they struggle to actually read it? Yeah. Because um, I'm familiar with a lot of it, but I, to hear it, I understand completely what you're saying. Right. But to look at it, I stumble over the words because I'm not used to seeing it written down. And, like, and that's one of the one of my beefs is that that I mean it is getting a wee bit better now. But one of my one of the issues is nobody in Scotland really is giving any kind of formal training in how to read this language. Mm -hmm. And so when people get to learn Robert Burns's poems, for example, 
they look at it and it's like looking at a foreign language because they're not used to seeing it printed on the page. When you start reading out, they kind of go, oh, right, I, now I get it. So one of the exercises that, we, that I do in the classroom often is I take one of the Roald Dahl books and I like photocopy a page from the English version and a page from the Scottish version, the Scots version, hand those sheets out. And I, so that they've all got, um, they can see the two pages, you know, with English on one side and Scots on the other. And then I will read out a sentence in English and I'll get, and I'll get, go around the class, get them to read out the equivalent sentences in the Scots version. And to, to begin with, none of them want to do it because they're, they're all looking at it going, I can't read that, that's, you know, that's nothing. And then one of them will be brave enough to read it out and they hear a word like hus or whatever and they go, oh, yeah, it's all right, we actually know that. And then suddenly they all want to do it. And by the time, you, it's, it's amazing how fast suddenly that you get to the end of the page and they've suddenly clicked and got it. And that, that you're absolutely right. There's a, there is a kind of dysfunction between hearing it and seeing it on the page. And that's one of the things, by producing books, we hope to, to, to try and reduce that a bit so that they get used to seeing it on the printed page. Yeah. One of the things that's really interesting as well around this, this topic is that um, we have a census every 10 years, you know, just where lots and lots of different questions are asked. And one of the thing, questions that has been asked for 80 or 90 years now is, um, do you speak Gaelic? And uh, do you understand Gaelic? And they've been able to then chart the decline in the numbers of people who speak Gaelic over the, the last century or so. And in fact, the last census, and the, the numbers stabilised. And you know, so we may actually have reached a place where perhaps they're going to go up slightly. But until the last census in 2011, no question had ever been asked about Scots. But they asked it in 2011. And what was really interesting, they asked the question, two questions, but the, basically what they asked was, can you read, write, speak, or understand Scots? And just to give you a comparison about, you know, how sort of the status of these different languages, how different the statuses of these languages is, Scot um, Gaelic is spoken by about 60, 70,000 people. The answers in the census to the question about Scots, 1.6 million people said, yes, we speak read, write, or understand this language. So there's a huge number of people out there who recognise the language, perhaps don't know exactly what it is they're talking about and dealing with, but they recognise it as something that belongs to them. And that was a fantastically interesting and useful figure to come up with, even though it's a bit rough and ready and perhaps some people weren't quite sure what was meant by it. Nevertheless, that is a huge number of people in a population of 5 million who actually say, yeah, actually that's something that we can respond positively to. So um, we'll see what happens, you know, with how that will affect or influence government policies in the future, educational policies. I think it took a long time for, for, for but, but what it demonstrated was that the sort of stuff that we're doing, and we're, you know, not, we're not now surprised that it works <coughs> because there's obviously a lot of people out there who do respond to that stuff. Yeah. I can and give you some encouragement now. My, my seven-year-old son was uh, P3 was learning uh, learning a poem in Scots, so he had to read it and learn it. Yeah, about Skelf. Skelf about too. Skelf. Well, uh, we, so. well we, that, that, that happens. I mean, for a long time, you know, every January, right around, around, around about Burns Day, kids in school all over the place do learn a poem a, a, or a song by Burns. Yeah. But, but what we're finding now is that that is actually happening more and more, and with a much wider range of material as well. Partly because we managed to make that range of material available. And that's been really good as well. And it's been important for us not just to say Scots is about Robert Burns, great poet though Burns is, he is 250 years old in the language he writes, it is 250 years old. But we've been producing books with poems that are contemporary, written by contemporary writers, so that the kids feel that actually it's got some relevance to their own lives. Yeah. Do you ever have difficulty deciding on which word to use? Because sometimes there's multiple words for the same thing. Yes. Depending on what region of Scotland you're in. Yeah, and that's one. Of, I mean, that's one of the things. The dialects of Scots are still very, very strong. So if you go up to the northeast, um, where 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 um, um, they call it the Doric, um, it, it's very different. It sounds very different. It's the same language, but it just sounds very different because the pronunciations are different and the use of words is very different. Um, a, a really good example of that is you know, on this side of the country, on the east coast, the word, the standard word for a child in Scots is bairn. 
But if you go across to the west coast to Glasgow, the standard word for the Chairman's Scots is win. And, um, and they don't, they, there's a bit of an interchange, but not much, basically. It's Bairn on the east coast, Wayne on the, on the west coast. And one of the books that I translated recently was The, uh, the Gruffalo and the Gruffalo's Child. And I had to make a decision about whether the Gruffalo was going to have a bear or a child, uh, sorry, a bear or a wean. Uh, but in the end, the Gruffalo had a wean because it was much, much easier to find other words to rhyme with wean than it was with bear. <laughs> Are you, I mean, life is stranger than fiction, you've discovered. Yeah, well, am I trying to sort of keep up with what's going on? Well, not keep up with it, but kind of continue to tell the story in a different way. Yeah, I mean, obviously I'm very interested in, you know, in what happens this year. Uh, We don't know what, uh, we've no idea what the the outcome's going to be. Uh, I mean, I'm very relaxed about it one way or the other, Um, but I I think it's, you know, it's a big moment. And... um, and yeah, that novel finishes in 2008. I'm actually write, trying to write another novel at the moment, which is set now. Um, it's not full on political, but it, but it, the, you know, it, it, because it's set in 2014, there's bound to be there's going to be references to this stuff going on. Um, and one of the one of the interesting things for me as a as a as a novelist uh, is that the re-establishment of the parliament means that you've actually got a kind of political culture going on at a much higher, a much more different level than, than existed before the parliament was re-established. And that gives you stuff to write about. You know, whereas previously, if you wanted to write a political novel, for example, then it had to be focused on Westminster uh, and London. Now, we've actually got our own political kind of stew, stew bubbling away down the road there. And that is interesting. And, you know, it's like lots of other countries. And I think that makes it... It's good material for somebody like me to, to, to look at and, and work around. Um, and um, so I think, you know, there is, even regardless, in a way, regardless of the outcome of the referendum, there is, there is increasingly more of a, a political, cultural, social scene going on that gives people who want to write fiction about it plenty of material to look at. And you see that in the writing of someone like Ian Rankin, you know, who's a... Who's a a big crime writer, um, the Edinburgh-based crime writer, but he he tends to lease his crime novels with with contemporary issues, and you know, and, and when the Parliament opened, you know, one of his novels absolutely focused, you know, was focused. I think there was a murder or something that took place mm-hmm. in or around the Parliament building. So, you know, I think most novelists would say that, that none of this is bad for us in terms of yeah. it gives us plenty of material to, to work with. Yeah. I think there's been, and one thing the referendum seems to have brought to Scotland is a real political awakening in terms of discourse. And you can't go to a pub or just go in the workplace and around hear it being discussed. And it's, uh, I find it refreshing. I think it's, uh, you know, it's easy to get complacent about, you know, political classes and negative, and then I, and I see that. And it, you know, I think, I, I think for your writing, this must be, you know, is bringing life to your kind of interests. I, th- I think that's probably going to be one of the biggest legacies of the referendum is, is that it has enabled people to, um, to, 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 to really start thinking about politics, as you say, away from the, the usual political tribes of you know, one, par- one political party versus another knocking lumps out of each other in, in, in Parliament. You know. This, this question is now kind of getting much more diffuse and as you say, it's, you know, people are talking about it in pubs and in their houses and, and so on and so forth. Um, not everybody, of course, some people are bored rigid and don't want to know about it, but you know, that's inevitable. You know, politics doesn't, doesn't sort of do it for everybody. But I, but I think the underlying question is really interesting and this is the one, the, the one bit that's frustrating about things so far, but I think, I hope that we will get as the, as the date approaches will get, um, this will improve, is that there's been an awful lot of knockabout stuff between the yes camp and the no camp. But the underlying question behind the referendum is, is I think, is not so much yes, no, you know, independence or not independence. It's what kind of country do you want to live in? What kind of Scotland do you see in the future? And if you, when, people, when you ask that question, people get really enthused about that. Because they, they, you know, they they, people do have... Um, 
strong opinions about what kind of country, you know, what kind of values they want. You know, should taxes go up in order to pay for this, or should taxes come down? Taxes come down in order so as not to pay for that. You know, I mean, that's the sort of question that I think this has opened up, and and I think that is refreshing, and I think it, I think it doesn't do anybody any harm. The other the other thing I think is really important about this is um, that the union happened in 1707, long before there was anything like democracy. This is the first time ever that people in Scotland have been asked, you know, do you want to be part of the UK or do you want to be independent? This is the first time that that question has been posed democratically when there isn't anything else at stake. You know, because in the past people have said, well, if you want independence, you can always vote for the SNP. But that's been at general elections when you're also having to vote for a whole range of other stuff as well. This time it is simply, do you want to be independent or not? And um, so in a sense you can argue it's the first time people have been asked if they want to be independent. It's also the first time they've been asked democratically, do you want to be part of the United Kingdom? And I think that's really, really interesting. And I think it looks as though there's going to be a very, very high turnout for this election. And that's a good thing too, because you know people are so cynical about politics that they, you know, they quite often don't turn out to vote. And I also I think it's really interesting that the, the voting age has been lowered to 16 and 17 year olds. I think it's a thoroughly good thing. Uh, I know some people say, oh, they've got no experience, but I mean, I know people who are 40 who are, you know, <laughs> they shouldn't have the vote if you apply that kind of, you know, uh, logic to it. So I think it's a really good thing that they've lowered the age, and I, what I'd love to see is that 16-year-olds should have the vote at all elections, you know, because that's how you engage people from an early age, you know. Um, I think people who are 16 and are old enough to have sex, get married, join the army and all the rest of it should be able to vote, you know. <laughs> so, um, so I think that's another good thing that's, that's come out of it. Arcadia event and most of us are um, students studying from different countries. Um, you mentioned your time abroad in America. Do you think that's really been like a, um, a change to how you see Scotland in politics? Uh, as the ch ch it's a change to how I see everything. I mean, I mean that was one of the, that, if I think about it, it was a long time ago now. <laughs> but if I think about it, that was that was an absolute key year in my life, to to step out of my comfort zone, to step out of you know the, everything that was familiar to me, and go. I mean, you know, going to Philadelphia in 1978 was, you know, it was so different in so many different ways, and um, and I and I think that I I just, I just think it was life changing, and to do that when you're 20, you know. Your sort of age. I mean, that's it's a fantastic thing to do, and I think I think it really does have that kind of permanent, long-term effect on your ability. Not you know your attitude towards your own country, your own culture. It makes you see all that afresh, but it also just just opens you up to a whole lot of stuff that you might not have been opened up to before. So yeah, I'm, I've, to me that was a massively important thing to, to happen to me, and uh, um, yeah, and. I don't know, it's very interesting, you can't really, it's difficult to actually think about what I would be like if I hadn't done that, but I know it made a big difference to me, and I know that I've never, I, I think as a result of that I've always thought about, I, I've, I think it's, it probably made me a more tolerant and open-minded person as well, because um, there were things that I, there were assumptions that I had made about American society, which then I had to rethink, you know, because that's what you do, you see, you, you, you know, you tend to think about Stereotypes, you know, one of the things that was really interesting for me going to America was that a lot of Americans had quite stereotyped views about what Scotland was like, but I equally discovered that I had quite stereotyped views about what America was like, and that's to me the beauty of, of the sort of stuff that, that you guys are doing and what I did is that it forces you to become more open minded, if that's not a contradiction in terms, you know, it makes you be more open minded, and I think that's a really great thing. So, yeah. <laughs> Is that a good point at which to start? Do you think? That's a, that's a, a nice defence of study abroad. <laughs> <laughs> but we're engaged in Canada, so thank you. Good. Good. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you.